it's with great pleasure that I joined a group from the Philippines, and I'm entitling my talk, A Year On in the Pandemic and the Imperatives of Solidarity and Equity for the Philippines COVID-19 Vaccination Program. So here is my outline. I emphasize context because I'm a social scientist. I briefly describe the Philippines and talk about our state of immunization of children, and then present some data about the willingness to be vaccinated and the acceptability of COVID-19 vaccines. I also present you some data regarding our current status, then switch to the fact that COVID-19 is just one of the epidemics we have and end up with uh, a plea that no one should be left behind. So context matters. We need to watch out for bias. We are human, therefore we are biased. And Dr. Barbash has pointed this out very well and Miss Paul also in their presentations. And let me quote for you from my late mother who was a national scientist and rural sociologist. Dr. Helia Tagumpay Castillo. She wrote about science, equity, and ethics. I've always believed that when the best science and scientists are devoted to the problems of those who have less in life, that is equity and ethics at its best. If science will serve a human purpose, what better human purpose is there? So for those of you who are not familiar with the Philippines, we are an archipelago of approximately 7,641 islands. We have approximately 110.8 million Filipinos and about 12 million are overseas. Um, predominantly Catholic, uh, able to read and write. A lot of people have high school and elementary level education. There's almost equal numbers of single and married uh, Filipinos and a greater proportion who are now in the urban areas and also live in the main island of Luzon. And uh, the ratio of male to female is almost the same. And we are a young population. As you can see, there's uh, about 63% who are age 15 to 64, 32% who are zero to 14. So this is the Philippines in a snapshot. Just to share with you some of the coverage of routine child immunization from 2016 to 2020, I know it's a busy slide. I just want to point out to you the last column for the fully immunized child. And the coverage has gone down. In 2016, it was about 70% for routine child immunization, went down to 67, went down to 66, slightly went up to 69. And of course, last year it went down to 50 also because of disruptions due to the severe lockdowns that we have had. In a survey done by the social weather stations, they reported that Filipinos are actually more willing to um, receive the COVID-19 vaccine that they were to get Dengvaksha. And here they compare for Dengvaksha, it's about 32% who were uh, very unwilling and 42% who were very willing. Versus for a COVID-19 uh, vaccine, 31% said they would definitely uh, not get the vaccine and 66% said they would definitely get the vaccine. So how about the acceptability of COVID-19 vaccines among key stakeholders in the Philippines? I share with you key findings from the focus group discussions done by the Philippines Department of Health, the Health Technology Assessment Council and the Health Technology Assessment Unit in February, 2021. So the evaluation framework, selection and financing of COVID-19 vaccines is based upon the following, responsiveness to magnitude and severity, clinical efficacy and safety, affordability and viability household financial impact, social impact, and responsiveness to equities. So this is the evaluation framework for the selection and financing of COVID-19 vaccines in the Philippines. The participants in the FGDs were asked, what are your desired characteristics of a COVID-19 vaccine to be in used in the national immunization program? Safety was the most common concern. 
vaccine efficacy in terms of preventing COVID-19, availability to Filipinos, transparency in the regulatory approval process and information on the vaccines, cost efficiency to the government, potential for high and equitable coverage, ease in logistical and implementation requirements, availability of mechanisms to compensate vaccine recipients for any untoward effect following vaccination, including treatment and management of adverse events, and the appropriateness of the vaccine to special at-risk groups and patients with comorbidities. So these are the desired characteristics of a COVID-19 vaccine as per the results of the FGD. What were some of the main concerns? As uh, I showed in the previous slide, safety and effectiveness, the need for clear communication information on the benefits and risks of the current COVID-19 vaccines by the Food and Drug Administration, by our Department of Health or the Ministry of Health and trusted health experts. All stakeholder groups generally preferred vaccines with higher efficacy, such as those over 90%. Many participants express willingness to accept vaccines with lower efficacy, let's say 50 to 70 percent, rather than having no protection at all, considering factors such as logistical requirements, cost efficiency, equitable access, especially to poor, far-flung, and disadvantaged areas. So across the different uh, groups, I ran a preliminary analysis of the data shared by the Department of Health. For healthcare workers, they were concerned about effectiveness, credibility of the vaccine manufacturers. For patient groups, it needed to be recommended by their physician, the same as what Dr. Barbash had observed in Israel. And they also emphasized the efficacy of the vaccine for specific patient groups. For civil society organizations who joined this particular study, the efficacy of the vaccine was important transparency and due process to increase vaccine confidence and real-time monitoring of both the patients and the distribution of the vaccine were also important. Um, the Minister of Health invited people, community leaders from low risk and high risk areas to join the FGDs. For community leaders from low risk areas, the safety of the vaccine and approval of the Food and Drug Administration were important. For those who are in high risk areas, the presence of clinical trials, safety, efficacy, and approval of the Food and Drug Administration were important concerns. What were the sources of information? For healthcare workers, clinical trial results from reputable health organizations, the Philippine FDA and even the US CDC were cited as, as sources of information vaccine studies, publications, and the internet. For patients groups, it was the department or the Ministry of Health, television, medical society websites, and also the webinars conducted by these different professional medical societies. For civil society organization, they relied on all sources of information, but also relied mostly from social media platforms used daily for communication. So instant messaging applications and exchanges with colleagues and the internet, of course, was an important source. For leaders from low risk areas, TV news, the radio, social media, Facebook pages of the Department of Health and news agencies, and also religious groups were sources of information for the different groups. For community leaders from high risk areas, social media accounts of news agencies and personalities, also of their partner NGOs and government representatives whom they follow on TV and social media platforms. So as you can see, they relied on various sources of information across the different groups. I looked at the CAP COVID dashboard because the Philippines is one of the 23 countries being followed since July, 2020. And the CAP COVID dashboard is run by the Johns Hopkins University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Facebook for Good. So here on the left, you see that in the Philippines, 48.2% of unvaccinated individuals reported that they will get a vaccine when it becomes available. While people think that 56 out of 100 people in their community will get the COVID-19 vaccine. So take note, the set um, cutoff here by 
CAP COVID dashboard is 75% for herd immunity. So how does the vaccine acceptance vary by demographic groups in the Philippines among unvaccinated individuals? So they found out that those who were 31 years old or older had a higher likelihood, 51 versus 42, for those who were younger to accept the vaccine. Those who had college or university or graduate school education, so 53% versus those with secondary school or below, 37%. Those who were urban residents, 50% versus those who were rural residents, 36%. And those who were male versus female, 56% among males and 41% among females. I belong to the National Immunization Technical Advisory Group. I am the only social scientist who belongs to this group and everybody else is a physician. Our one of our tasks is the uh, very difficult um, decision regarding allocation. So our priority groups are set in accordance also with the WHO SAGE recommendations. So in priority group A would be all of our healthcare workers followed by senior citizens, persons with comorbidities, frontline people, essential workers, and then our indigent population. Priority group B would include teachers, social workers, other government workers, other essential workers, other groups of significantly high risk for COVID-19, uh, and then those from other sectors too. And let me quote from the current uh, Undersecretary of the Department of Health, Dr. Maria Rosario Singh Verhere, the other day where she said, whatever agreements there may be for the purchase of the vaccines, at the end of the day, nobody will uh, lose anything. Everybody will, of our countrymen will be able to get a vaccine from the government. So each and every Filipino has the right and will be provided by that right to have these vaccines. So the vaccine statistics as of March 23, we are just actually starting out the rollout. Um, we received a total of 1.1, million uh, doses, 98% of us last week already distributed to um, 1,759 vaccination sites in 17 regions, and they've already been allocated. The first dose has already been administered out of these available vaccines for 62%. However, please note that we are again with the middle of a surge and I live in the area which is under a lockdown. So the imposed harsh lockdown restrictions still fail to control the spread of the virus. And we're one of the worst economic performers globally. And I quote this from Mr. Raja. I was a speaker in a webinar run by a French pharmaceutical company last week, and there were approximately 1,000 100 healthcare worker participants in that webinar. So I asked them, have you as a healthcare worker already received your COVID-19 vaccine? 68% said yes, they have. 3% said no, I am not likely to be vaccinated. 22% said not yet, but I'm already scheduled for vaccination. 8% said not yet, I'm still thinking if I would have myself vaccinated or not for COVID-19. Please take note, these are physicians, nurses, and other trained healthcare professionals. For those who have not yet received their COVID-19 vaccine, I ask the follow-up question. How likely are you to get yourself vaccinated for COVID-19? 85% said yes, they were highly likely to get the COVID-19 vaccine. 13% said they were not sure. And there was 2% who said they were not likely to get a COVID-19 vaccine. Let me now switch to the impact of COVID-19. And I quote from the late Dr. Jonathan Mann, who used to head the special program on AIDS of WHO. And in 1987, he said this in his testimony to the UN General Assembly. We have three distinct yet intertwined global epidemics. And of course, he was referring to HIV AIDS at that time. And I'm now paraphrasing it to our current pandemic situation. The first epidemic of SARS-CoV-2 is the viral infection itself. 
second epidemic inexorably following the first is the epidemic of the disease, COVID-19. The third epidemic, the social, cultural, economic, and political reactions to COVID-19. And that is probably the hardest part of all. It is worldwide and it's as central to the global COVID-19 challenge as the disease itself. I borrow here from the work of Rob Werder, who talked about the social impacts of COVID-19 in low and middle income countries such as the Philippines. The poor and your poor are at the risk of extreme poverty. The marginalized voices are not heard. There is no social protection. So 55% of the world have no or inadequate social protection to protect from COVID-19 shocks. And in Africa, 80% are not covered. There are also the gender dimensions of COVID-19 wherein the women and girls are most affected. Marginalized groups, have become even more marginalized in the midst of COVID-19. So older people, the migrants, the forcibly displaced persons, children, young people, LGBTQI, people with disabilities and informal workers have become even more marginalized because existing inequalities have been exposed and worsened by COVID-19. The lack of data exacerbates the exclusion further because we don't even understand fully what their situation is and how we can help them. In July, 2020, the National Academy of Science and Technology of the Department of Science and Technology in the Philippines invited me to give a talk and I entitled that talk, this thing called Corona. And they produced a social media card after my talk. And let me quote, policies for COVID-19 should be based on transdisciplinary and evidence-based science and good public health. Social, cultural, and behavioral realities, working together and communicating with each other are integral to a holistic response to the challenges of the pandemic. The so-called new normal is not normal. We need to pivot our responses, our priorities, policies, interventions, actions, and behaviors so that we can transition to what hopefully will be a better every day in a just and humane society. And let me end by emphasizing again that health is a fundamental human right. People in groups who experience health inequities lack power, political, social, economic. Vaccination programs need to be effective and sustainable. Access to the vaccine alone is insufficient. Systemic changes, policies, economic and social relationships are imperative to help empower marginalized groups and ensure that no one is left behind. Maraming salamat po, and uh, it's a great honor to share this afternoon. Thank you.